Glad you joined us this afternoon. Now, prospective senior high school students wrote the Basic Education Certificate Examination, BECE, a few months ago. Students are posted via the Computerized School Selection and Placement System, CSSPS. This system allows students to see the schools they have been admitted to and the program they were offered. On Wednesday, the Ghana Education Service issued a statement. And the statement reads, um, well, we have the statement here with us that management of Ghana Education Service wish to inform parents, stakeholders, and the general public that uh, there will not be any re-entry forms for admission into senior high schools for 2018-2019 academic year. The 2018-2019 academic year admissions will be based solely on the February 2018 and June 2018 BEC results. Students who wish to be placed into senior high schools are to take advantage of the private BEC registration in subsequent years. Management wishes the general public to take note of this new policy directive in order to make informed decisions. Thank you, and it's signed by the head of the Public Relations Unit of the Ghana Education Service, Cassandra Chum Ampofo. Well, Cassandra Chum Ampofo joins us on the phone to explain this statement. Thanks for joining us. Now, what does this statement mean? Thank you very much, and good afternoon to your cherished listeners. We entry forms were formed sold at the, at the same time or around the same time every year. And basically for those who could not go to school three years back and would want to, I mean, get into our senior high school, they pick up the form and then they fill the school that they want to be placed with their corresponding course. And we've been doing that since the inception of CSSP 2005. Mm -hmm. Now, we started three senior high school last year, and so a lot of things had to change. And one of them is the re-entry. We realized that we needed to do specific planning and to be able to communicate good, I mean, accurate figures to our superiors, I mean, our minister or the Ministry of Education, so that they were also be able to do the correct budgetary allocations and all of that. Now that um, government is picking um, up the senior high school, or now that senior high school is free. And so to be able to get these figures or have an idea of the figure we will be presenting every year, we decided to focus on the private research because when they register, then we get to know the, the, the we have an idea of the number that had registered, just like what happened in October, and, and they, 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 saw, they sat the exams over in um, February. We know now that we have 11,624 that wrote in February. And we also know that in June, this, um, that is coming June, we have 509,824 that will be settled. And so with this in mind, we'll be able to plan for infrastructure, we'll be able to plan when it comes to supplies, our uh, books, textbooks, notebooks, exercises, vehicles, and all of that that will aid them in the school. When we bring in the re-entry, we have really do not have any idea as to the numbers that we really want to go to school. I mean, those three years back, so it means that in 2018, then we'll be looking at 2017, 16, Yes, we know that some may have traveled, that some may have died, maybe some have also been up by the system itself, where they are, they have even started learning trade and all of We do not really have an idea of the tickets. Right. So we are saying that if we are saying that if mm. you if you are home and you want to get to our system, risk it. At least it gives you the opportunity to even better your grades and to get your dream school or your your school of choice. And so risk it. Let us know that you are ready. You want to go to school, and then once you have the current year's number, you will be paid. And so this um, is a purely policy issue that we are implementing. If I'm to understand what you're saying, you are scrapping this form of entry into senior high school because you are unable to keep track of the numbers if you maintain it. We are scrapping because we want to really do effective planning. Now that it is free, 
you want to really get to know the numbers and plan well to know the budgetary allocation for, I mean, education, especially with regards to those who will be entering senior high school in terms of infrastructure, right. in terms of supply. Right, you, you, you made that point. Are we not um, jeopardizing the opportunity that these young people have to enter senior high school because of our own inability to keep track of these numbers with the system? Well, this is not once and for, once and for all. They can rise next year. Um, I mean, subsequent years, we have opportunity. Every year, private research goes on. Why it opens up applications for those who want to risk it? And so for us, we are not, I mean, denying anybody of that chance. You how know, many students, year, if I may, how many students are being affected this year? How many students in terms of... Yes, how many students in terms of those who would have to wait for next year to write again? How many students are being affected? Well, as I speak to you, we do not have that accurate figure, and so I will not be able to tell you. But what we know is that we know in 2017, we had about um, 1,393 certain for the private based CE. Okay. And because we started the communication at the district level in the community, telling them that we will not be doing re entry this year, we believe that we have this indicator where in 2018 this year we've had. 11,624 certain for B, private BEC tested stably. So it tells you that the number mm. has really increased because now they are getting to understand that we are no more going to do um, 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 re entry. Thank you, Cassandra Schumann Popo, for joining us. She's the head of the public relations unit Anytime. at uh, the Ghana Education Service. Let's move from education and do some politics now because it was a tense moment at Mensha Palace on Wednesday as MPP executives went on their knees to apologize to the Asante Hene Otunfo Osetu II. The plea for forgiveness follows an outburst by the Asante Hene that they are active. there are active attempts by some people close to government to pitch him against the Achim's Acting General Secretary John Buedu and Ashanti Regional Minister Simon Osemensa and the Party Regional Chairman Bernard Inchi Buesiako and Regional Coordinator of the National Disaster Management Organization Nadmo Kwabna Sintri trooped to the Minsha Palace to prevent the wrath of the revered Ashanti King on the governing party. Mr. Buedu, who was also at the palace to secure Otunfo's blessing in his bid to secure confirmation as general secretary of the NPP ahead of the party's national executive elections. The entourage fell on their knees to assuage the king's anger, praying for clemency at the open court of the Menchia Palace. Otunfo's linguist, Bafo Kantankrache, at this point stepped in to intercede on behalf of the new patriotic party bigwigs who are still on their knees before the king. Love FM's Kwesi Debra was in the midst of it all, and he joins us on phone. Uh, Kwesi, I am told that Otunfo's linguist did not translate the exact words of Otunfo. Yes, yeah, that's what exactly happened. You know, the, the words were very strong, and, of course, as a linguist, you're supposed to say it in a certain manner. And most of the time, when they are talking, they do not really say the exact words. It's, it's a paraphrase that we, we need. So okay. those, that, that's what happened, Daniel. So this is not out of the ordinary? It's, uh, I, those there were, were, were a bit surprised about what happened. Because it, he, he was laughing throughout when they started talking about um, giving, giving his blessings to John Bordeaux for him to contest the general, uh, the general secretary position. But it was, when it was... When it was a stand for, for him to speak, that is when he, he suddenly was angered. He flew into anger and suddenly started talking about what the MPP has been doing to run a sentiment down. So it was a bit of a surprise to them. It was a bit mm. of a surprise, Daniel. What was that mood in the room when um, the NPP executives realized the anger of Otunfo 
and decided to go on their knees. Can you walk us through it that? Was, it was absolute, it was absolute quiet. It was quiet in the room. They were quite surprised because, as I said earlier, it was all laughter throughout. And suddenly, the, the king, the king got angry. So they were very surprised, and everybody was quiet because he wanted to hear what he, he wanted to talk, what he was actually saying. But these two persons that are talking about Gabi Ochidaku and also and as, as I said, too, have we done to solve the image of Asante Man as he is supporting? So is. his his specific allegation was to uh, Nana Asante Bedia, to Executive Secretary of the President and Gabi Asante Dako of the Dan Kwabuzia Institute. Absolutely. Well, when he started talking, it was all about people around the President who are trying to run Asante Man down. But as the anger went to the tire, then he stated the names, he stated the, the specific names that's talking about Gabi Ochidako and also to Nana Asante Bedia too. That they have, they, have been, they, have, they have been pushing certain persons and also giving certain people power to talk against the Asantehene and also to sell the golden stool, Daniel. To sell the golden stool, did he explain what he meant by that? I actually, he didn't go into details. And uh, well, where I was standing, it was a bit far. Right, and right. Yes, and he wasn't talking to a microphone. He was the interpreter. That was talking about the language he was talking to the microphone. Right. So it was uh, what that, I could hear from the microphone, and at least what the bit I could hear, I could hear from him. That's what what I I, could, I can talk about for now. That's fine. What was the response to um, that action by the NPP executives? Uh, can you come again, Daniel? What was the two force response to that action by the NPP executives? Yes. Uh, after after the language that um, Bafo can and Kreti begged on their behalf. Uh, he told them that he's forgiven them. And um, it wasn't, there wasn't that laughter anymore, but it was, it was a bit of indifference. So the MPP executive had, had to just um, get, get up from their knees and uh, go, go, go to wherever they came from. Uh, so it was a bit of indifference. There was a nation of anger after uh, the language begged on their right. behalf, Daniel. Right, thank you very much, Chrissy Debra, for joining us. He's our man in the Ashanti region there with Love FM. Now, President Ekofuado has highlighted the contributions of the Ghanaian media to Ghana's democratic development and governance. Addressing journalists from across the world on Wednesday, he noted the success of the Fourth Republic is largely attributable to the role of the media in ensuring accountability and development. On 7th January this year, we celebrated the silver jubilee of our nation's fourth republic. It has proved to be the most enduring and most successful of the four republics of our history. Its constitution has enabled us to establish our state on sound democratic principles, grounded on the separation of powers. Though the constitution of the fourth republic guarantees freedom of expression, including freedom of the press and other media, as a fundamental human right, and makes elaborate provisions to protect the freedom and independence of the media. The existing laws, which were continued in force by the same constitution, contain colonial laws and our statute books that were manifestly anti-libertarian and repressive of free speech. That is why, as Attorney General, under the government of the great Ghanaian statesman, His Excellency John Ajikum Kufour, the second president of the Fourth Republic, I led the process in Parliament for the repeal of the criminal libel law. The repeal, when it occurred on 27 July 2001, was a very happy day for me representing one of the high points of my public career. Even as one of the, mo of the public figures most constantly vilified in sections of the Ghanaian media, and who ironically was a principal actor in the repeal of the law, I continue to insist that its repeal was necessary in the public interest in our emerging democracy. I will say again that I must prefer the noisy, boisterous, sometimes scurrilous media of today 
to the monotonous praise singing sycophantic one of yesteryear. Now this year's theme for World Press Freedom Day is keeping power in check, media, justice and the rule of law. Journalists have been reflecting on the theme with deep-seated expectations that in the years ahead um, it will present a much more conducive environment to speak truth to power through academic and professional development, more research and a sense of self-worth to live up to this year's theme. If you are holding leadership in check to the highest of standards, that also means that as an individual, you yourself must keep to the highest of standards. It also means, having said that, that with every story that we look at, every issue that we raise on any of our platforms, it is aimed, first of all, at correcting a social ill, and secondly, since we are looking at correcting social ills, we are pushing to make sure that we get that resolution to those issues. A number of times we come in contact with public officials and persons in power who are not doing what is right. And that is a challenge, of course, to stand up to these people and demand that the right thing is done. So yes, it is a daunting task, but we are up to it. I think it's an excellent theme. Um, so far, the media has done well to keep her in check. Uh, uh, demand accountability. We are still demanding that accountability. I think the, the media is more aggressive now. Now the theme will, will allow media men, media women, to go out there and be bold, to go out there and demand more for accountability. I think that it will, it will encourage uh, journalists to go ahead and demand from uh, public officials what uh, is needed, accountability, what will help them uh, shape what they do in their various services. I think a perfect theme for a media like that of Ghana that is striving at achieving uh, excellence. Well, we've been keeping power in check in this country at least uh, over the period. Media is increasingly beginning to realize the power that we have as journalists. And so we get a lot more confident, a lot more bold, because you know that not everybody has the opportunity to be behind the cameras or the microphone. And so if you, if you look at the expectations that people have of you as a journalist, and if you look at what's happening in the country, you obviously will put yourself in the situation of the people and speak their language for them. And over the period, what I've realized is that journalists are beginning to get emboldened over the period to call authority to order and ask the questions and demand answers from them. And that has been impressive over the period, yeah. I will appeal to journalists who are so close to politicians, we should, you know, um, distance ourselves a bit, focus on our core mandate, and help the larger society, especially um, the destitute. So the ability to keep power in check is only enhanced if we increase our intelligence and information gathering. So the challenge on us is to get facts to confirm or to deny a lot of the counterfactuals that have been put out. We are in an era of fake news. There's a lot of attempts to discredit the media by no less a person than Donald Trump all the way down. A lot of people, when you interview them and they are hot, they start accusing you of bias. We will not be faced. Our job will be here. Presidents will come and go. Leaders will come and go. Political parties will come and go, but we will still be here because we oil the wheel of democracy. My, my charge to journalists is to be brave and to work hard. Your excellence will take you where your charisma will not. So we will have to keep at it, research the stories, go and follow the issues. Let's give voice to the voiceless. It's not just about interviewing politicians and big people. Let's do bottom-up journalism. Let's ensure that our profession helps to raise the standard of our people. That is the only way we can have peace. Um, I expect that media practitioners, journalists, will become more assertive and that media owners will allow 
journalists to do their work without any fear or favor, that the only way that journalists can be assertive and confident is if media owners are not overbearing, if media owners allow them the freedom. Very excellent team. If you, if you look at what is happening in the country, um, executive overspending, corruption, if you read the Auditor General's report, there are a whole lot of things coming up. So the theme captures almost everything we are dealing with as a country. Keeping power in check. I believe that over the last few months, what journalists have gone through in the hands of security men, in the hands of police officers, tells us that policemen are not, they are, they are not restraining themselves to the law. We should be using our pens and papers. We should be using our cameras and microphones to effect the change we want to see. Keeping power in check. Well, it reminds me of what I said just before the 2016 elections. Speak truth to power. If we're able to stand up as journalists to those in authority, not to rudely stand up to them, but to stand up to them with facts, with the truth, with what we believe is in service to our country and the people that we are serving, we will keep power in check. It is as simple as that. Accountability. That's why the RTI, there's a lot of noise being made about RTI. If we're able to pass it, and you know, we need to fine tune the bill a bit as it is. I'm sure everybody knows that, or those who are advocating for it know that. If we fine tune it a bit and information flow is readily available, I'm sure that keeping power in check will be, will come naturally to all of us. Someone once said that the job of a journalist is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. That is our job. We are supposed to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Now, if power is comfortable, it is up to us as media men to say that, look, you are too comfortable. Are you sure what you're doing is right? Are you sure the resources you have, you really own or earn them? That is our job. And I think we are doing that. And it's the right theme that we are on. And it's, it's positive for us. We need to make sure the right information bill is passed. That is number one. And as broadcasters as well, or as journalists, we should not be lazy. It looks as if majority of us have been too lazy of late. We, we want to sit down and wait for the newspapers to come, they will say this and that, and then we we'll conduct interviews on those things. It is becoming too common to me. We need to come up with something that we would go out there, look for the stories, investigate, publish, so that the ordinary Ghanaian that we are publishing to, the ordinary audience that we are serving, would gain something out of it. Keeping power in check. I I think we struggle with keeping um, power in check. I, you know, if you're a journalist, you are, most journalists I know are either overworked and underpaid, and so you are susceptible to the powers that be. If a, if a politician is giving you money to go and cover your rent, are you really going to be able to hold them accountable? Or if you are sitting down and hanging out with them because they're paying for your car, or even giving you money for something as small as lunch, how are you going to be able to hold them accountable? So I think we struggle with that. I don't know how to solve that. Maybe if we're paid really well, then that will stop. But right now, I don't see us. I think we try, you know, some media houses do try. But I think as a collective, we don't do as well as, you know, holding the people in power accountable. They're your friends. You can't hold them accountable. Journalists must be bold. They shouldn't be scared of any individual. They must demand answers from politicians. They must know that a lot of people depend on them in terms of getting their lives to become better. I think it's a role as journalists to keep power in check. But while we are that, we also keep ourselves in check. But um, we keep power in check if we tell the story the right way. We keep power in check if we don't let um, our work be influenced by what those in power try to give us. Probably they would want you to cover up on a story or something, uh, would want to push you to do something they, you know, unjust way. You don't keep power in check by doing that. So we have to know how to balance what we do and how to balance our relationship with others in power and all that. And when we do it the right way, I think we will keep them in power, we will keep power in check. My colleague Emefa Atiyama Eli has been speaking to the president of the Ghanaian Journalist Association, um, Roland Afil Noni. This is the 
that have been shared so far. A lot has been said about uh, protecting journalists to be able to do what they do effectively without any fear, without a, any fear that whoever is watching, be you a, pot, a political power, you know, you have a way of interfering in whatever they do. Do you think as a country and being the leader of the Journalists Association in Ghana, journalists have been given that needed protection to be able to execute their jobs? Um, the general environment is conducive to media practice and the empirical underpinning and evidence our ranking on the World Press Freedom Index in spite of the challenges over safety of journalists, in spite of their recklessness and overzealousness on the part of certain people who visit me. The fact cannot be obscured that Ghana is a beacon of press freedom. We have all the latitude to operate, we have all the space to write or say what we want to say. We also have constitutional guarantees. So in, in terms of legislative framework, the right legislative framework, Ghana has it. But at the same time, we are overly worried about the scandalous frequency of attacks on journalists in recent months. This reinforces the need for all of us to raise up, to rise up and confront head on this creeping impunity into our system. One dangerous element about impunity is that once it is not stopped, it has the tendency of igniting, energizing and self-propelling cycle, which then makes it very difficult, if not impossible, to stop. Um, we are not sitting idle by. We have had discussions with the IGP about two weeks ago, and he did assure us that the police will do whatever it takes to deal surgically with the perpetrators of um, the crime against Latif. We are waiting. We have our deadline. In fact, the police cannot continue to investigate this matter in perpetuity. We have in which we disclose. If the findings are not out, and if the recommendations are not implemented to our satisfaction, then we will activate a number of options we have. They are under the, under the wraps right now, but an attack against Latif, it's an attack against all of us. So it's not only Latif who has been injured, all of us have been injured, and all of us are bleeding profusely from the attack against Latif. And the only way, or one of the ways to stanch the blood flow is for punitive action to be taken against the perpetrator of the crime against Latif. Now, Roland Afel Money was speaking on the sidelines of activities to mark World Press Freedom Day which is being hosted here in Accra. Ace investigative journalist Anas Arimeo Anas has also been taking part of a panel discussion in activities marking World Press Freedom Day. The element which we miss out is how can that journalist, I mean, marshal forces and make sure that the evidence that we've got is in par with institutions that have the capacity to ensure that there is proper prosecution. That, I think, is a very, very important element. Sometimes, as we go undercover, there may be relevant information that if we had just opened one little book, we would have known that. You can write all the nice things about the people who were in the story. But at the end of the day, when you don't get that key evidence, your story would not stand in the court of law. That's what I think should be important to us as journalists so that our stories don't remain in our packets our stories have there's nothing more irritating than doing a good and walking the same street with that criminal you did the story about in fact that's the biggest threat to us when we do stories that seek to empower the bad guys to come and attack us so i would spend a bit more time 
is required. And also, pay key attention to issues of admissibility. So that if I am called as a journalist to come and testify on that case, the evidence that I have collected over the period will be admissible in the court of law. Look, the key thing about this work we do is about keeping society safe for all of us to be free. I don't think a police officer does anything different unless I'm recalcitrant ones. The bigger picture is to have a world that is peaceful or a society that is peaceful or a village that is peaceful. So those who go with those badges of exclusivity, I am not party to that. I think that if you're looking for a societal good and a general good, when it comes to a particular stage, you have to share that information with another body that has that capacity to deal with the issue. People may misinterpret it in any way. Oh, you are in bed with that institution. You are in bed with government. You are in bed with... But all my life, I've done collaborations with institutions. And I've seen that they are more effective. It doesn't mean that those institutions will not be criticized. But we don't possess any powers of arrest as journalists. We don't have it. But what kind of crimes have we not uncovered? So are we just going to say that when we uncover those crimes, we are going to let those people because of some exclusivity or some independence we want to maintain? I think we have to rethink that paradigm well and not assume that because they say you have to be independent, you hold that thing. It's to your own detriment. So when we look at power, my thinking is that we should learn to give our work that power by collaborating with others and the right people who can give it the power it deserves and not just hold it in our pocket. Perhaps another key thing to look at is that how do we, as a team in Africa, how do we have a more meaningful impact when it comes to cross-border crimes? And I think that my friend here, Dapo, the Premium Times, we are in talks about some heavy collaborations to do. A few of my colleagues, Jonathan Inamu, Kenya, I'm sure the Kenyan president will know him, and talk of um, Kasim Mohammed, all of Kenya. We are doing some very great work collaborating as a team. Because we've realized that today in Ghana we are talking about Tramadol. It's not a phenomenon in Ghana alone. It cuts across the African countries. And if anybody saw the BBC work yesterday and three days ago, it's all on the same subject. So no man can live as an island. As investigative journalists, we should learn to collaborate. That's the only way we can have a more meaningful impact on society. This will be my preliminary remark, and I'll take later. Thank you. I do three minutes. You're still watching Joy News today. I am Daniel Daze. Uh, we'll be back shortly.